Hello and welcome. I'm Jessica Nelson, events manager at the Brattleboro Museum. I'm delighted to be here with you this evening and so pleased that you've chosen to tune in for tonight's talk by Dr. Helen Shoemaker from my alma mater, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Hold on, having some sound issues. Here with you this evening and so pleased that you've chosen to tune in for tonight's talk by Dr. Helen. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so this event is being held in connection with the exhibit Hair Portraits, currently on view here at the museum, which features a series of tintypes by Vermont photographer Rachel Portese. The images are of women with their hair in these spectacular gravity-defying arrangements. Um, there are several layers of symbolism in the work, and it was inspired in part by Victorian era customs surrounding women's hair. That being the case, we knew we wanted to do a deeper dive into that world, and we were absolutely thrilled when Dr. Shoemaker agreed to give this presentation tonight. As Associate Teaching Professor in Miami University's History and American Studies Department, Dr. Shoemaker is the author of Love Entwined, The Curious History of Hair Work, which was published by University of Pennsylvania Press in 2007. She's also a co-editor of American Material Culture, an encyclopedia, and the author of Artifacts from Modern America, which was listed as a top 10 2018 reference book by the American Library Association. Okay, so in just a moment, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Shoemaker, who will give us her, um, who will join us from her office in Upham Hall on Miami's beautiful campus and talk with us for about 20, uh, 40 minutes or so. And after that talk, we'll do a Q&A. So I hope you'll stick around for that. If you're here via Zoom and there are questions that occur to you during the talk, um, you can type them in using the Q&A button on your screen. That will be a bit easier for us to monitor um, than using the chat box, which is um, more for if you're having technical issues. You may also notice that there's closed captioning tonight. Um, you can hide that if you find it distracting. So you just toggle your mouse to the bottom and it'll give you the option to hide the live um, closed uh, captioning if you, if you wish. And if you're watching via Facebook Live, just use the comment box and we'll keep an eye on that too if you have any questions. The last thing I want to mention is that if you haven't seen Rachel Portese's hair portraits, I strongly encourage you to do so. The museum is open, so you can come see them in person, but if that's not possible or you just don't feel comfortable doing so, you can check out a 3D interactive virtual tour of the exhibit, um, which you can find on our website. Rachel will also be doing a demonstration on tintype photography next Thursday, so we hope you'll tune in then. Okay, with all that said, I think we're ready to get this underway. So won't you please welcome Dr. Helen Shoemaker. Okay, I think that's it. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, join everybody and let me go ahead and... Are we set up to share? Right, Jessica? Yes, you should be able to share. Okay. So um, thank you very much for that introduction. And before I get started, I did want to thank um, everyone at the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. I'm really pleased to be asked to do this. And um, it's just been a delight to organize um, with them. And that includes Jessica, who, uh, Jessica Nelson, who just did the introductions. I also wanted to thank Rachel um, Portese and the absolutely wonderful and, and completely fascinating exhibit, uh, Hair Portraits. Um, as somebody who's worked with the 19th century side of this for uh, quite a few years, it was just so intriguing to me to see the ways um, that artists are using both the techniques and also expanding on the ideas and using the medium. So I wanted to start with this heart-shaped brooch um, that is on uh, um, Ruby Lane Antiques right now. It's offered by Robin's Roost Antiques in Nashville, Tennessee. And I came across this listing on Ruby Lane um, early in January as I was finishing up this presentation. 
And I find this example of hair work so deeply telling and revelatory of the ways in which hair work functioned in the 19th century. So the seller, Barbara Robbins, dates this brooch from 1870 to 1880, which is exactly spot on. Um, Jay Cameron, who uh, we see the engraving of, created with this brooch a literal piece of the heart. So the hair work isn't finely worked and almost all the examples I'll be showing, um, and there are dozens are of worked hair, that is human hair carefully worked into patterns, designs, and even pictures in full dimensional reads. So most hair work is prized for the fineness of technique and the skill of workmanship and the kind of odd beauty that this familiar material takes when it's worked into unfamiliar patterns and shapes. But always the hair work in the 19th and 18th centuries represent emotions. And the emotions of 18th and 19th century people were as complicated and messy as ours are today. We understand our emotions differently in a post-Freudian age, and perhaps we even experience them differently, but there's nothing tidy or organized about emotions, no matter what century you're talking about. And I think of this brooch as speaking to that and getting to the heart of what 18th and 19th century hair work was intended to represent. And that is the emotional and even bodily connections between individuals in all of their kind of messiness. Hair work took that tangle of feelings and relations and rendered them into a form, a kind of new form made of a familiar material. So I'm going to talk in three sections. The first section will be the longest, um, the history and the market of decorative human hair work. And we're gonna cover basically the American period, which is 18th to 19th century. We're also gonna look at um, 19th century sentimentality in hair work. And then finally, um, near the, uh, the shortest part of this will be a kind of open-ended musing that I have about the romanticism with a capital R um, of uh, creating a kind of commentary about thinking about help, uh, hair as a form of self-expression. So to start with the history and the market of decorative hair work, um, almost all of this material is drawn from my book, um, but I have brought in some new examples and I've continued to do research, particularly as you can imagine, as things have become more um, digitally available, it's helped greatly in me expanding some of what I argued. So the history of decorative human hair work has its roots in the political alliances between some of the most powerful families um, in later 1500s European countries. So typically um, in that time period when a male leader of a politically powerful or wealthy family died, the remaining family members would kind of distribute locks of the deceased person's hair um, sometimes in the form of a memento mori, such as a ring shaped like a coffin. In the mid 1650s, a more explicit idea of remember me was popularized and relics containing hair of the deceased were paired with death imagery or sometimes a likeness of the individual. It froze up there just a little, there we go. So hair work became a more fashionable item that is subject to changes in fashion and worn as a part of one's dress, um, roughly around the time of Napoleon's reign in France in the early 1800s, and that's very roughly. In America, hair work was popular from the mid 1770s until the end of the 19th century, and it was a run of over a hundred years. The styles of hair work in the United States parallel the styles popular in France and England. So this example that we're looking at obviously memorializes George Washington who died in 1799. And it's a good, good example of this early phase of American hair work jewelry. So there are a couple things that tell us that. The hair is pretty simply arranged under a glass cover um, in this case, it's the brown hair. We don't know whose that was. Um, this hair work um, is an example of just a simple braid with no real technique being used to manipulate the hair. 
Um, I'm going to stop, uh, kind of pause at this moment and talk about the, how the hair was actually worked, and then we'll go back to the market idea. So hair was worked in four ways, and the Muter Museum in Philadelphia actually had an exhibit a couple of years ago called Woven Strands, which was entirely focused on looking at these four techniques. So the first of the four techniques is dissolved human hair, and that was called hair painting. And in this technique, they ground the hair up and mixed it with gum arabic or another kind of sort of sticky solution, and then would literally paint it. So in the background of this, there's actually tiny, tiny bits of human hair. The second way that um, hair was worked was palette worked. And during the 1770s to 1820s in particular, palette worked and dissolved hair painting are perhaps the most popular in the United States. So palette worked hair, um, the palette, as you can see, is the rectangular palette in the image. Um, typically what you do is you take locks of hair, um, the pen that she's holding over the flame is heated. So it's like a curling iron and then you wrap the hair and arrange it and then you stick it under a weight so that it will stay in the proper um, position that you want. And this brooch shows that palette worked hair um, representing perhaps in this case, three individuals. We actually have three distinct colors of hair there, not very clear in the black and white. And this brooch dates from roughly about the 1860s. Hair workers could also make tight braids of twisted hair um, and then spiral that braid to create accents. And what we're seeing here is the braid being pulled taut and then twisted around a heated steel pen and then laid under a weight to keep it flat so it can be uh, mounted into a decorative item. Gimping is the third technique. And in this, you take two strands of wire you cross them and you pull the hair. So you have a long strand of multiple uh, strands of hair and then you pull the loops up, tighten the wire, pull the loop up and tighten the wire and you get this gimped wire with the hair. Um, these gimped hair wires could then take on a multitude, just infinite variety of shapes. And as you can see here, you can also mix colors so you can make your flowers look more floral by mixing the hair um, shades. And then the table work or braiding um, comes into play after the 1820s and table worked hair is probably going to be in some ways the most familiar of the images I'm gonna show. So table worked hair um, is, is created by, <laughs> In this case, these are steel bobbins. Each steel bobbin is attached to eight or 16 strands of hair and then weighted at the bottom. And then what he's doing is he's crisscrossing them and the braid of hair will kind of snake through the middle of the table, which has a hole in it. What you're gonna end up with with table worked hair are these kind of open braids that can then be manipulated into shapes. And finally, braiding locks of hair for a hair work album or in a letter or journal was popular throughout the entire um, time that we're talking about. Um, these hair work albums are entirely amateur productions. Um, I can stand corrected, but I've never seen a professionally created hair work album. And you could find instructions for these fancy braids in women's magazines and fancy work books about working hair, but you could also use braid techniques from other crafts and from um, fancy work manuals as well. You didn't, you could adopt other forms of instruction and just use hair as your um, material. And, or in the case of the men, if you're asked to contribute braid of hair, you can just take a lock of hair and loop it and be done with it. So in the 20th and 21st centuries, I actually see some of these techniques and even some of the ideas sort of resonating in our time period, and they aren't intended to be antique or um, looking backwards. So in this case, the friendship bracelets, and this is right off of the walmart.com site um, from December. Um, and I think I pulled this off just, just this week. So as you can see, the braiding table has morphed into a plastic 
purple and pink crafty baskety thing, um, but the same principle is being applied there. And then also we have the sentimental idea that has continued through time um, that particularly shows up with the idea of saving baby's first haircut. And this is from my baby album. I was the oldest of four born within six years. So my mom still had some steam and was still uh, doing the baby book. <laughs> So going back to um, the history of hair work and moving away from how it was created, um, in the US from the 1770s until the 1820s, most hair work is made by professional hair workers and often paired with portrait miniatures. So in these pieces, the hair work is usually not the point of the piece. Um, the painted miniature is the displayed part um, and sometimes even the findings or settings are the principal point of interest rather than the hair work. These pieces are usually between two and six inches in height. So portrait miniatures backed with hair were widely advertised in this time period. And uh, to quote one example, in 1782, a hair worker named and portrait artist named Hamilton Stevenson in Charleston advertised that, quote, he will follow the business of paintings in miniature and executing designs in hair. So this is another example. This is from Raphael Peel. Um, Raphael Peel, uh, his time period is 1774 to 1825. So this uh, 1815 portrait miniature is right in the middle of his adult career. So Raphael Peel had a famous father and a famous brother who were um, artists as well. But interestingly, Raphael made his living by producing both portrait miniatures and the hair work behind them. So in, er, in 1800, he advertised, quote, um, likenesses for a short time, fashionably set in gold with plaques and ciphers complete for $25 the miniature alone $10. So as we can see, when we look at this example, what Raphael was selling, and you can hear it from the choice of words is a likeness. And in fact, likenesses um, doubled or in the case of someone who actually went ahead and ordered the cipher or monogram, a, a tripled um, likeness. The other popular likeness was the morning scene. And here the hair is painted. And so in the case of this um, morning miniature or memento mori, the hair was made into a powder and mixed with gum Arabic and then painted onto the ivory disc. In these morning scenes, we'll see how sentimentality is layered over and into an image representing the individual. And this is where we start seeing um, the sentimentality that will characterize hair work for the entire century. So sentimentality is the heightened emotional expression of feelings. And in the case of a morning miniature, like Mr. Dunklin's, we see, we literally see the grief performed by this uh, morning woman. And we see the grief experienced by those who knew him but interestingly, that grief is expressed in kind of symbolic and almost generic images of grief as opposed to the real. This is on the back of that miniature. And so what's important here as we move into the 1820s is the idea that emotion has to be expressed in specific ways to be understood as sentimentality. And sentimentality is increasingly important for the middle class of the 19th century. It was a marker of being middle class. So we're right on the brink of it with this um, morning miniature. And um, I also wanted just to talk about a little bit about the generic. This is a miniature scene. Um, it's essentially a design blank. It's, it's more or less an unfinished version with palette worked hair in the fronds and also hair painting in the grounding. So this marvelous portrait of a young woman, she's quite young, she's about 17, in uh, circa 1820, 
gives us a clue to the fact that hair work is shifting in meaning and display. So if you remember the George Washington um, memorial brooch had uh, two braids under glass, somewhat simple frame, it did say Washington. Um, there's some differences that are gonna emerge in the 1820s and 30s. So let's look at the detailing here. Her necklace is woven of three braids of hair with a gold clasp in the middle. And this is, represents that shift I'm talking about. Um, in the 1820s to 1830s, the hair begins to move into becoming the entire jewelry rather than being under glass. And it is sentimental, but it's also an object of fashion meant to be worn and displayed as such. In this other example from the early 1830s, we can see a similar sort of way in which hair becomes more of the totality of the object and more openly displayed. So her earrings, the brown parts of the top and the drop are woven of hair, it's table worked hair. And then her hair brooch is also table worked hair um, wrapped up and then that drop, the brown part is also table worked hair. So we're gonna look at some slides of some of the jewelry from the 1820s to um, about 1880s. So they vary widely in um, sort of sophistication and fanciness. So we have simple braids of hair under glass. We have double or triple um, people in, represented. And one of the points of interest for me is that hair work, no matter the decade that it's made, in this long period from the 18th century to the 19th century, hair work is always about the intersection of the individual, the market of fashion, and this context of sentimental approval. So there's no good way to separate these as wholly being about the individual even as when we look at this, it's hard not to think that this is such a deeply individual object with the real person's hair. Um, but hair work was popular and it was fashionable. And it's one of these really interesting um, consumer quandaries. It's not supposed to be of the market. It's supposed to be of the heart. But it, that is even as the market provides legitimacy for the acqui acquisition and display of the hair work in the forms that we're seeing. So all these pieces tell us about the individuals and the lives they lived and those that cared for them. And these pieces also tell us about the larger world around those individuals, this world of sentiment, sentimentality, excuse me, and fashion that gave these objects meaning beyond just the personal experience. There were also um, in the genre of hair work, there are three dimensional objects such as wreaths made of that wire wrapped or gimped hair, or I'm sorry, wire wrapped hair and gimped, or um, album slash wreaths, which this is a good example of, or just the pure and beautiful hair work albums. This one being from the Harvard um, University, a, a relatively recent um, accession. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the market of human hair work. Um, and very specifically, we've already looked at um, hair workers who were artists like Raphael Peel in the 1780s to the early 1800s. Um, but the 1850s, the popularity of hair work increased substantially. And in seemingly equal measure, hair work could be professionally made or it could be made by an amateur. And manuals and directions and women's magazines and fancy workbooks promoted hair work as a feminine fancy work for the home. In 1850, the popular Godey's Ladies Magazine published a series of instructions for making hair work at home, both palette worked and table worked. So we've been looking at images of the palette worked instructions. And it claimed that, um, quote, by acquiring a knowledge of this art, ladies will be themselves enabled to manufacture the hair of beloved friends and relatives into bracelets, chains, rings, and earrings. So in that quote, we can hear some of that tension about a market-driven fashionable item that people increasingly wanted to make themselves to kind of protect it from that 
um, manufacturing world. And just another example that shows you the little weight that you put on it to try to fix it. Um, An amateur made hair work in this time period also included hair wreaths. So this example has all the markers of an amateur production. It has the gimped loops and fronds and some palette working in the cross. Um, I have seen some examples of professionally made hair wreaths and there clearly were some hair workers that could create hair wreaths for you. But typically most hair wreaths are like this. They're a little off balance and a little gawky. So the complicated story of hair work is despite this whole like um, busyness of the homemaking of hair work, it was really professional hair workers who profited from the popularity of hair work. And they profited from the popularity of jewelry like we're seeing here, as well as the hair wreaths. So at this point, I wanna emphasize all hair work was made by hand. But what becomes increasingly important as we hit the 1850s to the end of the century is whose hand made that hair work increasingly is uh, an important issue. So this is a page from a company called The Busiest House in America. It's a wholesaler. Um, and this gives you an idea of both how, how many, some of the designs that were commercially available, but also the fact that this was a, um, a manufactured, but in a literal sense of being hand created, um, large scale jeweling, a jeweler operation. The market of hair workers um, as a profession is a mixed bag. So after the 1850s, what we have is a mixture of small independent hair workers like Mr. Linher. We have um, many white women and white men who are renting out stalls or a cabinet in a jeweler store or had small shops. Here's just a few examples of some of the evidence of the small hair workers. So there were a number of women who actually made a profession of being hair workers. So uh, Katerina or um, Ms. Schmidt, um, whose work is featured here, that's the actual um, hair work that she created, um, was able to keep a hair work um, shop in Philadelphia for about four decades. There were also a few African-American hair workers who specialize in creating hair work jewelry. And a couple examples of that is Adolph Oswalt, who was identified as an African-American man in Chicago in 1865, and an African-American couple in Philadelphia, George and Elizabeth Stewart, who made hair work professionally um, for a few years after the Civil War. Um, the hair work tradition that we're talking about here is very much in the U.S., largely confined to the white, middle, and upper classes. So I wanted to show um, the salesman's sample box. This is from the Winterthur or Winterthur Museum. And um, what we're seeing here is the entire cases of hair work samples. So the trays that we're looking at right here have a combination of palette work and hair painting with a couple table work chains in the middle section there. And a couple more images from that salesman sample box. And at this point, um, I expect a lot of these images look really familiar because the, um, the styles and the imagery is pretty generic across the um, decades. Versions of table worked hair, we'll see an example that looks remarkably similar to this pretty bulbous looking chain there and some thinner um, hair work chains and flat braids. These are all waiting to be mounted, but actually what the salesman sample box is, is a professional hair worker um, shopping around their designs. So um, that's the small end of the scale. The larger end of the scale is that there were uh, major larger hair work houses the busiest house in America was a jewelry wholesaler. The National Artistic Hair Work Company specialized in um, producing hair work for jewelers around the country. 
These companies made hair work to order. Um, the orders placed through local jewelers. So a customer would go to the jeweler, pick out the style from the catalog, give the hair, the hair would be mailed off. It would be worked by the company and then sent back. There was a lot of suspicion um, after the 18. 50s, basically, that there was pre-manufactured hair work that was pretending to be worked from your loved one's hair, but was actually already made and on hand to sell. So one of the, um, the sort of weak links here is the value of hair work what, is that it was made by hand of the hair of a loved one. So when you sent your hair out um, to a company like National Artistic or through your jeweler, or as we'll see, even to Wards or Sears as a mail order, there was always this question of whether the hair was actually the hair that you sent in. So this world of professional hair working is balanced really uneasily between the kind of promise of absolute fidelity of self conveyed through the hair and then the sentiments that were supposed to be from the heart, but not the market. But everybody wanted hair work that looked right and looked like the object of fashion that it was. And for that, you typically ended up going to a commercial hair manufacturer. So um, I'll talk a little bit about how that worked, this whole kind of world of hair working in terms of amateur and professional. So this is Mark Campbell. We already saw him um, with his example of his braiding table. And he was a hair worker active in the 1860s and 70s and based out of Chicago. And he simultaneously sold his hair work services and popularized the, um, the fancy work of making one's own um, hair work at home. So in 1867, so that's uh, just after the Civil War, um, Mark Campbell published his first version of his self-instructor in the art of hair work. And he followed with at least one later product, um, publication in 1875. Then he went bankrupt, but different story. Um, while he provided instructions for making hair work oneself, his main business, and this was packaged in his self-instructor, was um, taking mail orders. So his instructional manual functioned both as a style book, offering prospective customers illustrations of the work he could complete for them, while he also told them that you could try to make it at home. And this is an example, this isn't Mark Campbell's, but just to give you a sense um, from that last picture, um, if you think about embarking on your hair work project and you're thinking of trying to produce something like this, you can see why many um, a woman might start a hair work project and end up sending the hair into a professional hair worker to have it done and then mounted with the fittings that she chose or the fob in this case as well. So Campbell was a super entertaining salesman. Um, in 1862, in a brochure, he waxed eloquent about the um, hair work. Actually, it was a directory of Chicago businesses. And he asked, um, who that has gazed upon the hair wrought in many a strange and artistic device, secured from the wavy ringlets of some beautiful girls or the brow of the loved or the lost? but will cherish them as the gems of the beautiful forever. So that's pretty touching. Um, that's also a good example of how he tended to highlight the complexity of the beauty of these objects, um, which was a great sales pitch for uh, his readers. So despite these really high flown sentiments, um, he accompanied that kind of talk with images of his hair braiding room. Um, and that hair braiding room image that we see here gives us a more realistic understanding of how professional hair work was actually made in the second half of the 19th century. So we see a man um, over here uh, standing at his braiding table. And as you can see, these women are sitting at their braiding tables. Um, and I suspect that most of the hair work jewelry that um, you can see online or in antique stores today 
And most of what I see in museum collections was probably made this way by professional hair workers. And after the midpoint of the century, so after about the 1850s and 60s, um, professional hair workers um, that are, are usually, I don't think working in these manufacturing rooms, um, they're picking it up, they're piece workers. So they're picking up the order with the hair, creating it and then bringing it back to the merchandiser to be sent back to the um, jeweler. So we're gonna, um, even in uh, 1900, hair chain mountings are still being offered in wholesale catalogs um, that are directed at jewelers. So what we see here is um, both Sears Roebuck um, and Montgomery Wards offered hair chains um, through their mail order businesses. These are in the big catalogs that were sent out to millions of families. But um, in the 1890s, the production of a commercial hair work definitely shifted. And I can tell you that what happens here is the commercial hair work becomes a kind of brutal in its um, sell points. So in 1891, one wholesaler offered three strand hair vest chains, which was the most popular kind of hair work jewelry for men at the time, a dozen for $36. So that's ready-made hair work chains that you bought and then you would sell the fittings to the customer and then have that. So the hair had literally no connection to the buyer. Um, and that, that's a real shift in the sentimental meaning behind these um, beautiful pieces of hair work jewelry. The company, by the way, that offered those ready-made chains would do a made to order orders as well or made to. Um, in the 1890s as well, this whole idea of the jobbed hair work just, it just starts to pick up and almost all the companies that are offering hair work by the 1890s have really um, shifted to this sort of ready-made or like Sears cautioned its customers, they said, quote, we send it out, but we can't, cannot guarantee same hair being used that is sent to us, you must assume all risk. So. This is at the point where I will talk a little bit about why hair work died out um, in popularity. So there are a whole bunch of reasons and perhaps we can talk a little bit more about those. Um, but I think that, you know, style shift, especially for women towards lighter colors and fabrics and textures, decorating styles um, for those big hair wreaths that we saw, the interior decorating styles shift over to lighter looks and fabrics. Germ theories argued that layered complex textures held dirt and dust and bugs, quite rightly. Um, and sentimentality itself wanes. Um, it's not that people stopped feeling sentimental, but the ways that those feelings were properly expressed changed dramatically. Um, the last very end date that I can find is the last piece of commercial hair work offering I've ever found is um, uh, eight, uh, 1924. But hair wreaths and hair albums continued to be made at home, that's for sure. So even into the 20th century, um, the craft of hair work, as I just mentioned, was still around. And this is E.E. E. Crawford's book. It's kind of a pamphlet, um, Living in Utah. And it, this, however, is set up both as a easy way to make pin money and as a nostalgic craft. So that's 1911. Um, in 1924, this is that um, the last mention I have found, um, one wholesaler, uh, Otto Young and Company, and they started business in 1865, and they were still offering ready-made hair work, and they also offered that they could do repairs, um, but they didn't do made-to-order hair work anymore. So what these companies are offering is really just in the 1920s, something that's really sentimental and honestly looks too Victorian for 1920s people. <laughs> um, just all of the changes that happen in styles really um, dramatically affect the popularity of this. So I now wanna talk a little more briefly about 19th century sentimentality and hair work. So hair work was popular for so long because of the sentimentality it represented. And that sentimentality was central to white middle-class identity in this nation. 
And so one way to think about sentimentality is that it isn't the same as sentiment. So sentiment means variously according to the OED, one's own feeling or what one feels in regard to something. Sentimentality is a word that emerged in 1770 and it is something quite distinct. It is um, according to the OED, the affectation of sensibility, um, exaggerated insistence upon the claims of sentiment. So the difference between the two is performative. Sentimentality is acted out for others to see and approve of, while whereas sentiment can be an internal emotional affection. So hair work, in my interpretation, was emotions made physical. And even better for 19th century Americans, hair rendered those emotions, those kind of sentiments, into an object that was visible to others, intended for display and made the owner seem properly sentimental. The fact that hair work could be made professionally or amateurly doesn't really matter here. What matters is the willingness that a person had to make out of their emotions an object of sentimentality held up for others approval. So as we see here, a young man with a business suit with his hair watch chain peeking out from behind his jacket. So many um, of you, I think I've got 20 here um, or 19 counting me, many may be proper familiar with Jane Austen's 1811 novel, Sense and Sensibility. So in which one sister, Mary Ann, um, the sensibility sister is swept away by her enthusiasm for romantic poets and romantic ideas and romantic landscapes and a charmer who has memorized Shakespeare's sonnets and can recite them in romantic fashion. And she actually fears that her sister's beau, Edward Ferrars, is not suitable because he isn't properly moved to emotional display when he reads romantic poetry. So Mary Ann is sensibility. Um, swept away not only by her emotions, but by her insistence upon performative display of those emotions. And sensibility of the late 1700s and early 1800s morphs into the sentimentality that we see of middle-class America in the 1830s to 1900. So to go back to this, um, Wonder, well, actually, it's a new image, but to go back to this idea that in the 1830s, sentimentality became central to how white Americans identified themselves as non working class, that is, having the proper sentimental values of the middle or upper class. And hair work becomes a principal way that you can demonstrate that. So here we have her hair necklace and her um, hair uh, cross made out of hair. And here we have, of course, her, the bracelet made of hair. So none of this diminishes the, like, just the deep humanness of hair work. Um, when we look at this stuff, we're looking at the objects made of an, the hair of an individual who has, is long gone. And we see the emotional experience of those individuals, not just in the hair, but those people around that person, all bound up and presented for our viewing. And it, Talking about it this way doesn't mean that anything we're looking at is insincere or silly either. Um, rather, hair work represents the emotions and ambitions of living people who are now gone. So it's, it's about the ways individuals are tied to one another. Um, in hair work, those disparate individuals are literally linked together forever in the object, even if there are individuals whose hair isn't in the object the individual who owned this hair work, the example we're looking at right here, owned this piece is a present in the object, even though the hair of the um, braids is of the woman in the portrait photograph. So these deeply personal statements of self and connection have meaning, but interestingly, because of that market. 
So here we have commercially produced findings, the, uh, the portrait photograph and professionally created braiding, all of which speaks of the market. But the hair, <laughs> It's her hair. <laughs> it's her photograph. These speak to the intimacy of the emotional connections that are represented by the piece. So the last part I want to talk about is something I call the romanticism of creating. And that's a commentary on hair as a material of self-expression. So I started to prepare this presentation by viewing the exhibit online um, by Rachel Portese, um, Hair Portraits. And then I watched um, the wonderful artist talk that she gave. Um, and uh, I have here November, but I, I think it was posted in November when I got to see it. So my remaining comments are not gonna be a commentary on the actual exhibit, because that's not what I was asked to do, but more about the ideas and the linkages I see between the 19th century practice of hair work and contemporary artistic uses of hair work, of human hair, sorry. I won't be reviewing other artists that do human, um, that use human hair, but I, I wanna comment in a broader way about the reasons I think hair work um, is um, being used in art today um, as it carries forward some of the meanings and significance that it had in the 19th century. So as I was thinking through some of these new ideas, I was also rereading um, Charlotte Bronte's early 1840s novel, The Professor, which is not one of her most widely read, but it's skinny and it's fun to read. So the novel was written before Jane Eyre was published, um, but it was written, or I'm sorry, it was written before Jane Eyre was written. Um, and Jane Eyre was published in 1847. So what happened here is that Charlotte Bronte's novel, The Professor of Tale, was rejected. So she shelved it, and it wasn't published until 1857. Um, she died in 1855 of, and I cannot say it correctly, but hypermamesis gravidarium severe morning sickness. Um, in the novel, her professor is a low-paid teacher at a girl's school, and he's fallen in love with a mousy little lace maker who works on a um, pillow with little lace and bobbin. And in a conversation with a male friend who's mocking our narrator's supposed love for this like bold, brassy gal running the girl's school, he muses, he could not be aware, that is the guy who was mocking him, could not be aware that since then, youth and loveliness had been to me everyday objects, that I had studied them at leisure and closely, and I had seen the plain texture of truth under the embroidery of experience. So one thing that really struck me about this passage is this idea at the end of the plain texture of truth under the embroidery of appearance in terms of thinking about hair and hair work. So I think that this quote really gets at the heart of what's happening in the 18th and 19th century um, hair work. For the owners of these objects and the makers of these objects, the important part was that plain texture of truth. The embroidery of appearance um, had these sort of little touches of fashion and maybe even a little bit of performance to it. But that embroidery of appearance underneath it all we have that really solid plain texture of truth. So the, the material of the hair worked or embroidered doesn't manage to obscure the plain texture of truth, those emotions and relations. Um, and this example is actually from my own um, private collection. So I'm gonna make a real leap here because the other thing I did is I watched the documentary McQueen um, about Alexander McQueen who died, uh, who killed himself in 2011. Um, and he's just an extraordinary man, painfully brilliant. And it isn't happenstance that one of the major couture artists of the 20th and um, 21st centuries was also understood to be a romantic. In the documentary, Andrew Groves, his former partner and sort of, you know, help, helpmate, um, says that, quote, at heart, Lee was a romantic. And that romanticism is because of that physical relationship that to what you produce, which then comes back to the idea of craft. So what I found really, really um, 
helpful is that Andrew Groves is pointing to the way that craft merging with art is a deeply romantic with a capital R um, process. And um, that got me really thinking about the craft of making hair work. So the romanticism that we're talking about is that late 18th century artistic movement. Jane Austen's poking fun at it in 1811 with her character, Marianne. So romanticism asserted that the individual was literally the center. The emotions were the animating force of the human experience. An emotional life connected outwards and was structured by nature, objects, and other people. So Andrew Groves, when he's talking about Alexander McQueen, is pointing to the fact that as metaphysical and metaphorical as McQueen's designs could be, there was always the practice of craft. And I think Groves is right to connect that love and compulsion to craft of conceptualizing and designing and creating a new object that's an extension of the maker's self is itself a romantic idea. So it really made me think about Portese's body of work, particularly the sort of use of a variable and organic process of tintyping and the, the use of live and attached hair and flowers and branches to show how the self moves outward and then back into itself. It's very deeply romantic with the capital R in the idea of romanticism. So going back to Alexander McQueen, um, and I did not put up an image because the copyright warnings are so amazing um, on the web, I did not cut and paste an image in. So just imagine or Google um, McQueen's uh, 1992 debut collection, which was part of his master's work or his 2007. So Alexander McQueen, um, you know, couture design is one of the last arenas in which we see craftsmanship shaped around the body, the human body. And clothing acts as an extension of the body and of the self. And in our long centuries, from the 19th century to today, um, we live in a world of consumerist identity making. So the objects we choose to adorn ourselves with are intended in that kind of romantic tradition of self-expression to be who we are. And so it's not surprising, for example, that Alexander McQueen actually turned to human hair as a material. So his debut collection um, introduced a pink overcoat patterned with barbed wire and was inside lay, um, lined with human hair. And in his 2007 collection, he actually designed and had designed jewelry such as memento mori rings and that included human hair as a part of the design. To go, keep going with the uh, couture designers and their, their sort of involvement in this, uh, in June of 2020, the New York Times has had this quirky series called DYI and they featured Rick Owens who um, he chose to do a hair embroidered handkerchief as his craft item. So it's just a fascinating example of that kind of self-expression. So as I near the end, I wanted to go back to the 19th century. Um, in 1856, the editor of the Home Journal lauded the popularity of hair work jewelry, both as a refined taste, and as we can see here, gratifying to the heart's tenderest affections. It is a dearly cherished memento linking us fondly with those from whom we are separated by distance or death and, and seeming as it were to conjure up the very presence of the departed. Thinking about that kind of romantic idealism. The romanticism of hair work is in its assertion that I am individuality and emotions and relationships are constituted and generated through the manipulation of hair itself. So it's a form of creation using one of the most intimate and permanent and lasting productions of the human body. Just placing even just a smattering of hair clippings under a glass heart within a gold worked frame of the brooch moves us towards that transcendent promise of romanticism, that individual's realness, their real self is developed through their emotions and that that is going to be able to transcend death. 
So there's a persistent thread of connection, I think. Hair is as an extension of the self, hair manipulated and transformed, but always remaining of the self. And above all else, 19th century hair work used crafting, the basic art of making one's material into um, another form to represent love and connection. So the objects they made speak to us today of the permanence of individual lives in the fabric of the past and of the present. And that is the end. Helen, thank you so much. This was fascinating. I feel like I have a lot um, kind of percolating after all that. Um, and I think I was always under the impression that um, hair work was um, from the deceased, but that doesn't sound like it's the case. No, and I'd always just figured, you know, someone died and they made a piece out of it, but um, it just sounds like it was a connection to a loved one. I was curious with some of the women um, in the jewelry pieces, do you have a sense of, you know, what loved ones they often, <laughs> Yeah. Was it brothers? Was um, it do you want me to stop sharing or? Yeah, that'd be great. So then okay. we can see our full heads. Um, so I also can see I went, I went long. Now I can't. Oh, the closed captioning's blocked the stop sharing. Oh. <laughs> there, we were silent long enough. Um, so to go to that question, um, the hair that you see in the hair work jewelry is um, the hair of children or deceased parents. It can be the hair of a uh, fiance or wife when especially with the hair watch fob chains yeah. that were worn by men. Those are typically made of the wife's hair, sometimes the mother's hair. Um, you can also find hair work items that, for example, um, people literally just ask friends to give them a lock of hair and then they'd make those big hair reeves. I've seen hair reeves that have represented over 40 individuals in a neighborhood. Like they weren't even, like people, <laughs> they weren't even related. They were just making a really interesting object for the fun of it. Um, but most of the hair work jewelry is um, usually made of either mother's wives hair. Um, less common are those large pieces with children's hair. Um, in my experience, when a child died, they, they would often make a hair reef they wouldn't necessarily um, um, make a piece of hair jewelry like that because the hair was so fine yeah, and it, it wears. And so I think to protect it, people made little hair flowers or hair wreaths rather than have it be like a bracelet that you, you debraid away. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. And if you do have questions, I see some coming in, um, just toggle down to your Q and A at the bottom you can, type a question in, or if you're feeling really brave, there's the raised hand function. And if you do that, I'll unmute you and you can actually talk to us here. Um, but we do have some questions coming in. So um, Ellery asked, um, well, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, do you have thoughts about present day emphasis upon DNA and any parallels to 19th century emphasis on relics and the physical fragment of the loved one? Yeah, so um, the first thing that comes to mind is there are a lot of supposed locks of George Washington's hair out there. And I know that like the DAR was genetically testing its locks of George Washington hair to try to establish if they really were. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, there's a, a kind of almost unsurprising way in which people want to use DNA to establish authenticity of uh, heritage, I guess I'd say. Um, and the ways in which hair work was used um, as a form of representation that could capture the person in its real form. So one thing to think about is through this long period of time, photography is there. Like people had access to likenesses, but um, a lot of people when they had their first photographic likenesses taken were appalled. Mm. And I have one woman in my book who literally writes her fiance and is like, I refuse to accept that that's what my likeness is. So I'm sending you my hair inst instead. Because you know, to her that image just didn't suit it. 
So I think there is that kind of common thread of hair as authentic. Um, they had no thought about the root of the hair being somehow more valuable for DNA research or even the root of the hair being um, particularly more authentic than the rest of the hair. Um, so yeah, but I think that whole idea of relics, the 23andMe is kind of a, I watched some of those videos and it's a weird version of that kind of relic of mm -hmm. connection to the ancestors or the people before. Yeah. Um, from Maya, she says, thank you. This is fascinating. Do you think that period hair, hairstyles for women were influenced by the possibility or probability of contributing to hair work at some point? No. Um, and, and I'm actually, I'm hesitating a bit because, um, so my, my basis of that is not people saying anything about it. It's about the way that short stories talk about hair and hair work jewelry. Hair work jewelry shows up in 19th century fiction all the time. Um, in fact, when I was just finishing up the final bits of the slides and the narrative, I came across a quote by Emily Dickinson. You know, I have like a running tally of these. In none of the stories I've read have people said, the character said, like, I'm going to grow my hair to make hair jewelry. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure that they did. I think it's more that the long hair was there. Yeah. Um, the question that was, that question though, also points to why hair work might have died out. Because especially as we get into the 1920s with the shingling, um, or even in a lot of silent films, the good girl will roll her hair up and make it look like a bob. But, you know, the hair, the hairstyles have changed so dramatically that it's really older women who have the long hair um, when we get into uh, the mid 1920s. And so there's frankly, it's just not going to be something most people will think about. So it's almost like the reverse idea, maybe that part of why hair work died out is because women's hairstyles change in a fundamental way towards shorter yeah. hair. Yeah, fascinating. You need a lot of hair to make those braids. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you need a lot. So I'd say after the pandemic, we might all be there. Yeah, we'll all be ready. <laughs> and in fact, you know, I go on the web and I think, well, maybe there's a lot of people on Etsy selling ready made to order hair work. And I thought, well, everybody's gonna have long hair. So. <laughs> increase that market. Um, do you know if they're from Susan Miller here, is there a way or even should you um, clean hair wreaths? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know of any conservation methods. Um, I just read a couple months ago uh, is it that long ago, uh, a great report of a conservation master's student trying to clean um, a deteriorating piece of hair jewelry. <laughs> that was his thesis. It was really oh. great. Um, the techniques, I would actually contact one of the major museums and ask them for advice or Google Collectors Weekly, maybe. Um, I, I can say that the only techniques I've heard of are really gentle vacuums and um, artist brushes or makeup brushes to lift the dirt off of them. Mm. So, and even under glass, the, the you know, these are, their dirt gets in there, but as you could see from some of the images, insects get in there and lay eggs, right? So the eggs are in there. They didn't come with the hair, like people cleaned the hair before they worked it but um, they do get infested and um, occasionally get beetles. So I would recommend super care. <laughs> and um, I, I think using a brush to kind of lift the dirt off really carefully. Um, I don't even know. I think I, I ex the, I'm blanking. And the National Park Service may very well have a bulletin because they have thousands and thousands of bulletins on the web on how to care for um, items, conservation items for small museums. So yeah. that it might be in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it looks like we have a couple of hair kind of artists um, who watched the talk tonight, which is great. Meryl says, I really enjoyed the talk. I remember seeing lots of hair work at the at Buttonwoods, a history museum, have a real um, mass. 
when I was growing up. Do you see many contemporary artists that use hair in their artwork? I've spun and woven my own hair and used some hair in dolls I've made. I wonder if there's others who have done so as well. This is where I wish I'd done some of my homework and I could answer with specific names. So I don't have the specific names, but I've seen um, particularly uh, there's a number, there's at least a couple um, African American artists, women who are using hair um, in kind of ways to talk about the diaspora and about um, the experience of being female. Um, there's also, I know that there's an artist and I'm gonna, I'm completely blanking who had a show I think in California and she was Asian and she was using the hair specifically to talk about the immigration experience. So I think that there's a lot of contemporary work of hair that is a comment on racial, ethnic experiences and diasporic experiences. And then on the other side, um, I think there are a number of artists um, who are using hair to comment on questions about the identity and self. I've noticed that that seems to be the consistent theme is that almost all the contemporary artists when I'm just browsing around the web and looking at stuff, um, what they're using the hair for is really to make a commentary about self-creation or self-identity. Um, one of them, it, it was from a long time ago, but the John Michael Kohler Art Center in Wisconsin did a show uh, two, 25 years ago on hair and that was paired with contemporary artists and, and the theme of that was creation of self. So I'm sorry, I should have done my homework. I kept thinking I needed to <laughs> get my list of people off my bookmarks and I didn't. And our audience is jumping in to help. Susan White mentioned oh, good. Clark, Thank you. <laughs> an African-American artist and professor sorry. now at Amherst College. She's um, actually some work I came across when we were looking at events for the museum for this exhibit. Um, and Susan also says um, she's had your book for a while, was thrilled to see you were giving this talk and many thanks to BMAC. Thanks. <laughs> she's hoping to see Rachel's work in person soon. We'd love for you to come down. Um, and she's been working with her since 1997 in her artwork and I'll send you over um, her website. Um, but love seeing the images that you shared tonight. Um, so thank, thank you, you, Susan, for that. Um, looks like I have one or two more questions. Um, if hair work was part of middle class culture, did working class people who might not have off, uh, afford, be able to afford hair work items, did they still preserve onward pieces of hair as memories of loved ones? So the, the first thing is that uh, working class Americans could have used hair work to represent middle class ambitions. Mm -hmm. um, also, as we know, it's not a, a necessarily a 20, 21st century phenomena to have people um, claim a class position higher than themselves, or in the case of really wealthy people, lower. <laughs> um, so that's the first thing. Um, a lot of the hair work was actually fairly affordable. So you could get a hair watch fob, for example, for between five to seven dollars if you went to the low end. So um, it's hard to know how much the, the class breakdown is of ownership. Um, one thing I, I know, um, I absolutely know through the historical evidence is that hair work was claimed as a middle class and upper middle class and elite object. So that's the first thing. The second is, um, I think that a lot of the sort of very simple and plain brooches that we see where their hair isn't hardly worked, it's almost as if somebody bought the, the brooch form and then put the hair in there on their own. Mm. And I think that might have happened a lot that people just wanted to have the piece of jewelry with the hair, but really didn't want to pay to have those elaborate sort of flat braids or worked hair done. So um, the involvement of working class people is an area that I did not cover in my research. And um, that's one of the things I, I think a good solid master's student should go in and, <laughs> and, and dig around because um, there's also the fact that most of the hair workers I look at, um, particularly the single women and the people of color are really working class artisans. They're not middle-class people. Um, and so there's also that funny thing of the people who are actually creating the hair aren't necessarily in the middle-class themselves. I think that's a piece I found really 
fascinating was where the market meets emotion, because I think I'd always made this assumption too, that these were just pieces done at home, you know, like women learn how to embroider. They were also just learning how to weave hair. And I, right. I don't know why I didn't think in that direction. Of course, there was probably a market of these like hair rooms and or places you send pieces off to, but um, right. yeah, I found that piece really fascinating too. Um, well, Helen, thank you so much um, for you. this really fascinating talk tonight. And I think it's done a really wonderful job of kind of illuminating Rachel's work in really different ways too. Um, I know when I go back to the museum, I think I'll, I'll definitely look at it um, differently than I was before, kind of given this very rich history of, of hair work. Um, so thank you for, for that this evening. Um, thank you. Yep. And as we noted, the museum's open um, Tuesday through Sunday. So if you haven't had a chance to stop on by and you're local, please do. And if you're not, um, please check out our tours online um, so you can get a closer look at the work. Um, but thank you for spending your Thursday evening with us tonight, folks. We really enjoy it. Stay safe and take care of yourself. Good night, everyone. Good night.